ACE, the IFPI, the RIAA, the MPAA, and the Dog Army here in Saskatchewan. And today I have at least one, possibly two guests. Uh, uh, one has been muted and I don't know if they're actually going to participate, but they're welcome to actually chip in if they feel the, the urge. So in the meanwhile, guest number one is Seth Stevens, who is a not a lawyer, but knows a thing or two. So what he says is not yet legal advice, just like everything I say, but he may actually know what he's talking about, at least as far as U.S. law is concerned. And so Seth, other than that, how would you describe yourself to the audience who may have never encountered you? As any of my social media sources usually say, I am a science fiction writer, a game designer, and a computer securities and legal development researcher who tries to help people. But typically I'm just a crazy nut job that sits behind a computer. Right. And that's kind of like the view that I probably had with you the most is the the long-winded rants that we both share this common heritage of long-winded rants that bind us together on that side. But we were talking a little bit before we started in terms of the idea of, I think your quote was individualistic social programming. And I thought that that was a good place to start. So what is the the issue here in terms of programming? So every person is programmed in some way shape or form. Every influence, every media, every show, every identity you have is some form of a program. If you have a favorite book or a favorite book series, that becomes part of you over time because you start to identify with characters and tropes and traits in what you're reading and you start to emulate that in your day-to-day personality. The same goes to your media sources, the same goes to your music sources, the same goes to your identity. So we all have the different elements that influence us as to who we are and we emulate that in our day-to-day lives now that's perfectly safe the problem is is when we start to emulate that so much that it starts to influence our decisions it starts to influence how we think it starts to influence what we vote for who we vote for or more importantly how we treat others this is where it becomes extremely dangerous and individualistic social programming is a big big thing for large corporations and large media sources and more importantly large political sources and groups that want to curb that in one direction or another to influence how you think so that they can control what you think and that's where it becomes drastically dangerous like look at me looking at me just the way i'm dressed right now everyone reading this or listening to this or watching this is seeing their own perceptions of me as a person before I even talk to you. You see me as what? A pirate, a thug, 
a criminal, a bounty hunter. I mean, what image do you see me as? Or maybe I'm a badass. But you automatically pre-deduce who I am before you even talk to me just because of the way I look through your influence. And that's one of our biggest problems in our society right now. So just to give like a little example of that, because we have to make these snap judgments in practice yes. on some level, yes, especially if we're dealing with people we don't know or we're dealing with large groups of people and you only get that like one interaction to make that first impression or to make that impression at all. Yeah. Somebody made a point this week that I happen to be banned on CBC, the National Public Broadcaster here in Canada. And so like yes. if all you know about me, if all you've heard about me is that I have a name, Jeff Cliff, and I'm also banned on the broadcast network that everyone gets their media from, then the default assumption is I've done something wrong I'm an evil Correct. and dark person and a, maybe a pirate on top of that, who knows. But right. it, it's like a, an easy decision to make when the only thing in your life is this authority source and perhaps the friends in your life that also have the, the same authority source. So, exactly. And it was interesting that you made the point in terms of that we have these things that program us. It determines who we are because we face problems in our lives. We face problems that we have to deal with both in terms of COVID, in terms of social issues of getting access to a job, getting access to a life, a career, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of what determines our success and failure winds up boiling down to who we are in terms of that. And so how we program ourselves, what media we surround ourselves with, what books we read can impact the outcomes on that side. So it looks like you're about to reply there. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just listening. Sorry. And so, and go ahead. You're very correct. Your, your assessment is very astute in that, and that's part of the catch-22 to this entire equation. To be an individual is growingly more and more difficult as time progresses because if you don't conform, especially with this with us or against us mentality, that we see very commonly here in the U.S. If you don't conform to one ideology or another, you're the enemy. And that's a dangerous mentality to have because now we're looking at this mindset, especially with our current political climate, which is its own mess. If you don't conform to this ideology, you're immediately the bad guy and you should be ran out. It doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter how you think. It doesn't matter that you didn't conform. And one of the things that the goth community especially was notorious for was that whole mentality of, I don't want to conform. I want to be myself. I want to think for myself. I want to make my own decision. But even recently, with this whole Biden versus Trump fiasco, you saw the goth community going, we're for Biden. We're for Biden. Anyone that doesn't think like us, they're the enemy. And it's like, whoa, when did the goth community stop being about individualistic perception and start being about conform with us, join us, or you're the enemy? That's not what we're about. Also, it's and interesting to hear reality. this reflected from the, the side of the, the left and the, the blue side of the yeah. political spectrum in the United States, because yeah. I mean, those of us who are old enough remember that this used to be a Republican thing. And that yeah, yeah, George exactly. Bush, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. It was the exactly, uh, exactly. very, very common to hear 20 years ago on the right side of the political spectrum. But we're definitely, without question, I think, hearing it on the, the left right now. And we're here. Well, and what's scary is you're hearing it on both sides. You're seeing this drastically divergent mentality happening both on Republican and Democratic and liberal and all the major groups saying you're part of us or we kill you type thing. And it's like, no, we're a country based on the differences of opinions. We're based on that freedom to think differently and recognize that that person across the street from me or my neighbor may think differently than I, and they're welcome to it so long as they don't point a gun at my head and tell me that I have to conform. Right. But where did that go? And it's a scary revelation that we are seeing in our culture and our society this mentality of, I hate to use it, brainwashed masses, where people are becoming programmed by their social media resources to such a degree where they are blindly accepting whatever they are fed as truth without verifying it. And then when they go to something like Snopes, oh, well, this is true because Snopes says so. And you go, okay, well, Snopes says so. They must be reliable until you research Snopes and find out Snopes is only 75% accurate. So are they reliable? Good question. And we have to start to question 
What is the motivation behind this agenda? What is the motivation? What is the purpose? Who benefits from this game? Who benefits from the situation? If Trump wins, who benefits? If Biden wins, who benefits? If Bernie Sanders wins, who benefits? And that's the catch-22 that no one pays attention to the bigger picture. They only look at what's right in front of them right now. Here's the threat. Here's the issue. And how are you going to accept it? And it's like, no. Why are we getting smoke and mirrors in all of our media sources and just blindly accepting whatever was spoon fed to us? And I think part of it, you hammered on a little bit in terms of people don't take the time. And yes, it's really easy to get all of your news, either from the television or in the modern day from Facebook, where it's just sort of on your feed, you see this, the headlines, it, you kind of skim through it, you don't necessarily have to click through, and God forbid checking whether any of it is true, yes. right? Yes. And, yes. I mean, I've been caught. I've been caught sharing things that aren't true. I, <laughs> I'm terribly guilty of that more often than not. I see a headline that I go, hey, this is good, grab throw. And I don't even watch it all the way through, especially because, especially if it's YouTube, you'll get a commercial or 15 before you're able to watch that entire thing. And with so much being rapid fire information of our day in society, you don't have time to sit there and wait through that commercial to see if that's legitimately what you're looking for. So, so and the same goes with news media. And it's the cash 22 of our culture. And the crazy thing is there is information available yet. Right? Yes. It, it, there is censorship. There is problems with the distribution of information but just to give like a little drop of an example today yes. i found a repository of what purports to be a membership roster in the chinese communist party now this oh, really? is a large large list i think it was like 300 megabytes text uh, so you can imagine how many names are going to be in that and it is not impossible and some journalists have already started to do the work of finding out okay who are these people and some of them turned out to be and again, I, this is the point where I stop believing <laughs> because I haven't been able to verify, yeah. but people in prominent positions in the Western world say, and, you know, go out and find out who these people are, whatever, and maybe, maybe this is true, maybe this is not true, but it's something that you can do. You can actually go through yes. the, this list and go, okay, are these people, one, real, two, do they have any sway over anything important? Because if they're just like people in China, members of a party in China, that part doesn't matter, but it's that yeah. takes time. And so is there anyone actually doing this? Of all the people in the world who could be doing this? Hard to say, but. And that's the reality to it. And when you, you're looking at, say, a communist party in China projecting to, say, Americans or Canadians or people in South America, it starts to make you question, why is that? Why is it that we are pushing international registry to register as a member of this group or that group when, very realistically speaking, you're not in that country? So why does it matter if you vote there unless there is that? juxtaposition. And that juxtaposition is trying to influence you in your society to think like this society so that you influence your society to be more like that one. Hmm. And that's where it becomes dangerous. And so on that side, on the, the, the one idea of this cultural value of being able to coexist with people you disagree with, that's like yes. one yes. thing that you would probably change a little bit, at least in terms of both of our, our societies, in terms yes. of encouraging more people to be more tolerant. Yes, it's essential. I mean, you can't always expect every random person to just conform to the way you think. It's not going to happen. As much as that's a great utopian mentality, I think it was Sean who said it best that, you know, you can have this utopian society where everyone is conformed and converted to one general idea. But we, the logs, are going to be those outliers that are going to question everything and keep our guns and our mecha hidden yeah. for that one time when an alien invasion happens and none of us are prepared. And you cannot assume every person you encounter is there for your benefit. And you cannot assume that every person you encounter is just going to blindly conform. You're always going to have an outlier. You're always going to have that 5% that will not convert. I mean, look at the Nazi movement. They took over an entire country and yet had soldiers within their own ranks freeing the slaves or freeing the slaves, freeing the prisoners. 
and freeing the Jews and hiding the Jews within their own house. A great example is the recent comedy, comedy movie Jojo Rabbit, which really covers that exact fact. You had this little boy who was growing up to be a Nazi, and his mother was, you know, fight the good fight and be the good soldier, and all the while turning around and fighting the war efforts <laughs> and secretly helping people to the point of where she actually hid a Jew in their walls while trying to fight the war effort. And this movie was released as a comedy, but it's a satirical comedy that makes you really go, wow, wait a second, this is more serious than we thought. And the level of satire and comedy definitely helps sometimes yeah. in terms of allowing us to have the ability to, if not say things that are true but socially unacceptable, at least yes. conceive or, or see things that are true but not yes. socially acceptable. And uh, yes. one, one of the things that I wanted to uh, touch on today is Awake with JP, which yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you've, you've heard of. And oh, yeah. He's, it is, he's rather entertaining. He, he's becoming fairly popular in the world as a comedian. Oh, I I've mentioned him on this show before. He is, seems to be more on the conservative side of things, which, I mean, allows him to have an audience on that side. But he sure. definitely sure. swings at both sides. And he, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah I, he does, he does. Like, I haven't been able to, like, watch enough of him to see if he, like, tilts one way or another in terms of more of his focus, but he really does attack both sides with equal satirical wit and does a good job of it and really does try to, like, think of the absurdities that are the consequences of both sides' worldviews yes. and brings yes. them to light in an amusing manner. And yet... Lately... I'm sorry. Please continue. And so I've got a Facebook post from him in front of me now suggesting okay. that, quote, his days on Facebook are numbered and to join him on Parler, uh, Parler being a social media alternative to Facebook yeah. that is just as centralized, yeah. just as at risk of most yeah. of the problems that Facebook has, but it isn't Facebook. And so that's that's his choice of where to go next. But it's interesting to see comedians being kind yeah. of targeted by yeah. Yeah. institutions like Facebook because they're, they're so effective at doing this. And you had a good point of another comedian that we both know that has had a, a similar yeah. experience on that side. Yeah, uh, to the ranting Griffin had a similar issue, and a lot of people, especially in the furry community and the convention communities, have grown to hate him as a person, partially because of some of his views regarding child porn, which is a whole separate topic. But what it was is at the time, his views on that was more geared towards he had colleagues and friends who were questionable in that direction, and he wasn't entirely sure where to stand on it. And it becomes part of the, as we call it, it fungus, where you know somebody that's doing something that is against the social norm, so automatically you start to question, are they right or are they wrong? Because the social norm says this is bad. And you go, well, yes, I think it's bad, but this other person thinks it's good. Oh, crap. And you become stuck in this loop of how do I and then on top of my that, friend they're, away they're, from this bad behavior or am I the one that's flawed? Right. And you have to reevaluate. And he eventually came out after they had a falling out. He and the person in question, and I'm not going to out the other person. Yeah. The other person said, no, no, this is how it should be because this is the right way. And he went, no, no, you're fucking crazy and walked away from him. Hmm. And since then, he's recanted a lot of his stances and statements against the things that he was so pro-supportive for, and the reason why he was pro-supportive of those things was that he was openly trying to push the narrative that he thought the community he was a part of wanted. Right, and and so, so as a comedian, like he, he was process. well attuned to understanding what people wanted yeah. to hear, what people wanted to laugh about, where the, yes. the level of consciousness in his particular target community was, and if he wanted to amuse them and also shed light on truths perhaps it does seem like he was he had that skill of where to, yeah. to aim and so that was part or it seems to me to be part of what he was doing on that side yeah and as he pointed out when he got ran out of the furry community he was trying to do what he thought the community wanted and he became such a loud voice that he became an outlier and they shoved him out the door <laughs> At which point he started reevaluating for the last two, three years, trying to figure out what had he done wrong. And he realized his mistake was he gave up the identity of self to conform 
to the mainstream of what he thought the community he was part of wanted. And this returns back to that whole social programming issue. We give up our own identity to conform to the image of what we think our group wants. And that can become Nazism at its raw core. It can become fascism in any form. The mistake we make is the assumption that fascism only reflects a Nazi mentality. Hmm. But fascism is any forced ideology of conformity. Any system of ideals or any system of belief where you are forced to conform is fascism at its core. And, and, and like even even if we like in the what's wrong world, there's this idea of tabooing words where we basically like yeah. realize that, that this idea of fascists like has so much baggage, and everyone has this oh, yeah. vision right. of like, okay, fascism is wrong, but then when you ask why, everyone disagrees. Yeah. And exactly. that's the part where, like, okay, we can dissect what actually is wrong with it by basically just dropping the word and then continuing the conversation. But one of the interesting things that I think you pointed out is that this idea of that this occurred in the furry community and that your yes. experience, you mentioned the goth community, that there are these little subcultures yes. and communities out there that go against the mainstream grain and that as a right. one of the things that binds them together is this kind of alternative way of looking at, if not their particular interest, then at least that there's this rebellion baked in, in a sense. Yes. And so if you encounter yes. someone who you disagree with on some moral level or on some topic that is worth considering and then you think okay well this person believes this I believe the opposite and is it me who's wrong yeah. is it them who's wrong and then there's the question of tolerance you know how much should I tolerate they're being wrong and then there's also this yes. like level of like the rebellion level kicks in there right where it's like if it is wrong, should like it may not even be a conscious thing, right? But like, is it okay to get away with, right? And then that's like a, yeah. a level. I think that's actually operant in this particular case as well, because I mean, I'm not in the furry community, but I've seen the same right. dynamic happen in other communities as well. Um, and and so, neither am I. I'm not in the furry yeah. community. I am kind of a person who watches it from the skirts, as, as I do with many other communities, and I analyze and I study what their cultural structure is. Because let's be realistic, subcultures are a culture unto themselves, and they have their own dynamics, and they have their own common norms and their own ideologies, either good or bad. They are still inherently structured for those communities. And I find, from a sociological perspective, when you look at subcultures, you see a much more diverse area of analytical analysis where people start to analyze different ways to live that's outside of the common norm. And this gives you a much broader perspective of a way to see society outside of what is, you know, red versus blue. And then many people go, well, what about purple? Combination of both. And no, 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 that's not allowed. Why? Why is that not allowed? Why are we not allowed to have a divergent opinion? And subcultures create that divergent opinion. It creates a different way of looking at it. And I think it's intrinsic as a society to not go, oh, God, no, you know, furries, oh, God, those, that, that's gross. Why is it gross? Why do you think it's gross? What makes you think it's gross? Have you looked into them? Have you talked to them? Have you spoken to them? Have you listened to them? It's like, do you have no. a furry in your what? life? Have you been around them yeah. long enough to know? Have you been around it? Have you gone to one of their conventions? Yeah. No, you just immediately we make it taboo because it doesn't conform to your ideology. Well, if it doesn't conform to your ideology, then is it you who can't accept it? Or is it something about them that you're not willing to accept because, again, programmed? And this is still cyclical. And people don't realize how much of our lives are being steamrolled towards certain directions and you're either with this mentality or against this mentality. And you don't realize that everything is cyclical and it becomes that question of how much of self are you willing to give up to conform to what you feel is your peer pressure and what you feel is your sources of common norm by your common communities. And if we have another person. <laughs> oh, did we gain a person, or did I think we lost her? I'm not sure. Well, I think we lost the person. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, mystery, mystery oh, guest well. didn't participate, but but that's fine. And like the idea of the cyclical nature of it. One of the things yeah. that like was also levied against me this week is this. I'm portraying me as a anarchist or a libertarian. I've yeah. worn the anarchist hat. I've worn the libertarian hat. It, it's just a, a thing that comes up consistently all 
all the time, where you identify with the left, you identify with the right, and then you, you realize on both sides that, oh, hey, there's power, there's these relationships, and why don't we just like get rid of the power? Why don't we just get rid of yeah. the, the institutions that are the problem? And so if you keep going down the road a little bit, you get to like the libertarian perspective, and if you keep going kind of all the way, you get to the anarchist perspective. But in both cases, there's yeah. this idea of like things aren't working, and yeah. there are problems. Yeah. So let's solve the problem by getting you know massive change to the institutions of power. And in this context, I think that we have this problem of this peer pressure and this seeing ourselves as members of a group, so behaving a certain way, getting a rise out of people in a certain way, saying certain things to align with this peer pressure. And then while that's going on, there is also this issue of there are powerful entities. There are corporations, there are governments, there are churches, there are mosques, yeah. etc. that are also a factor of this. They're still yeah. operant, they're still driving, <laughs> right? So, oh, yeah. and I'm just wondering if, like, on that side, in terms of this dissolving of the identity of the self side to appease the group, do you see that part of the dynamic as well? And do you have any examples? Oh, very much so, very much so. I, there was a coworker of mine, and it blew my mind away talking with him. With the automotive plant that I worked at, he had presented to me, and he came from Chicago, and, you know, African-American gentleman from Chicago, who was a Republican, and I was like, wait, what? How is that plausible? And he went, well, hear me out. And I'm like, okay, this should be interesting. And he presented to me the very real fact that a wide margin of African-American citizens here in the U.S. are actually converting to Republican because they pushed the democratic agenda for so long and it got them nowhere. Hmm. And they were like, we don't understand why this is not working to our advantage until they realized that the accord is supposedly, and again, this is according to my coworker, and I haven't had a chance to research it, but he said that in the last eight years, the Black Lives Matter movement was actually all to push the career of a now noteworthy African-American rapper. And I went, what? And I looked into it, and he's white. There was this major guy, and I can't think of his name. I think it was like Little Wayne or something like that, stated the first announcement of it and pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and pushed it until they became so big that they then pushed away from it and became this separate entity. And that falls back into that easy to digest, easy to accept norm that we blindly go, oh, well, yes, that must be right. But we fail to realize that oftentimes a simple thing like even Black Lives Matter can be used for a political agenda that was not what we intended it for. Hmm. And we don't see that. We blindly accept, well, this must be true because X, Y, and Z. And my friend over here, they're noteworthy. They believe it. So therefore, I should too. Instead of analyzing it for ourselves and questioning what is the purpose of this? What's the game behind it? And it's one like, of the things um, that I've noticed that was done really well over the past four years or so, once Trump yeah. got elected, the, yeah. the news oh, yeah. media really dug in and because oh, yeah. they felt that they were blindsided. It's like, where did this come from? And they really did yeah. do a fairly good job of like dissecting the alt-right and dissecting yeah. the groups and the movements and the people, the individuals, mm -hmm. the personalities. And it's there if you want to read about oh, yeah. it. Like, if like, you're brave enough to read about it. And yeah. The problem is, is that most people either A, are not brave enough to read about it because it contracts and contradicts the very thing that they have been programmed to believe, or B, they're scared to read about it. Yeah because it contracts and contradicts the very things they've been programmed to believe. So they immediately go, oh, no, no, that's on that good take. Oh, no, no, that's wrong. Oh, no, no, that's lies. Yeah. Because this blog over here who has 4,000 views says it is, therefore that person over here who has no influence, who has no knowledge, who has no record, says it's wrong. Therefore, I have to believe them or I become an outlier or a pariah in my social norm. Right. And that's a dangerous mentality to have. And that's where we're at. That's the, you know, that's the basis of 1984. That's the basis. Equilibrium and all these other movies that have been talking about this for years and years and years. The moment you blindly accept the common norm is the moment you blindly accept without thought. And that becomes dangerous because now every new resource is just feeding the machine and is just feeding the monster and is just making you more and more 
blindly accepting something that isn't actual fact. Right. And I did want to also get to this part. I'm not sure how you yes. feel in terms of this particular topic, but one of the things that also happened this week was the YouTube and Facebook pretty much oh, yeah. universally yeah. Uh, started filtering anti-vaccination groups yes. and posts and yes. that sort of thing. And now just yes. as like a disclaimer, I fully intend on not only getting the vaccine whenever any vaccine comes to Canada that I'm able to get my hands or into my body, <laughs> I fully yes. intend on doing it on video. And I'm maybe I'm just joining the crowd on that one and being the sheep following the crowd. But like, I, I really do want to be part of the data collection on does this vaccine work? Uh, and the reason why I bring this up is because if the vaccines, if there is some problem, if there is some reason why maybe we shouldn't take it, if there is some reason to be skeptical, which again, I'm not going to suppose that there is, but if there yeah, is, yeah. We won't find out about it through Facebook or YouTube right now. No, and no, not so all. So that not feeds all. into this like confirmation bias loop that yeah. causes us to be unwilling to even imagine whether or not they could be unsafe. And that, to me, is a dangerous situation. Uh, it is. It very we much really is. don't want to be and in, especially for the whole makes this <laughs> worse as the levels of danger or concern is, yes, Facebook and YouTube and other associated media sources are banning anyone that even doubts the vaccine or doubts the virus or doubts any of these other elements. But what becomes more dangerous is when you look at the core roots source of all this. COVID is arguably a huge question on its own with its research going all the way back to as far back as easily 2013 or 2013, 2003 in Emeryville, California. Now, that strain was COVID-3. We're now currently up to COVID-19. And it becomes this question of how much of each strain is still connected to the original strain. And if this is something we've been researching in each of its mutagenic forms, how much of it do we already know? Right. Now, there's the bat soup and there's the drug injections and there's the 18 different strains that all came out simultaneously and blah, 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 blah. The problem returns back to the core of when you're dealing with something like a vaccine, there's a company behind that vaccine. And you can question science all you want. And you can, I believe in science all you want and more power to you. I have a problem when the parent CEO or the executive of that company that's currently releasing that vaccine is Bill fucking Gates. Yeah. <laughs> I have a huge fucking problem. This is a man who made his billions lying to people, selling them broken things, and worse, creating viruses for computers only to get hit with an antitrust in 2002-2003. And I will also away from Microsoft. I'll, I'll bring up, in and addition then, to the, the antitrust okay. in the U.S. context, in Canada, yeah. this week, I've noticed there's an antitrust case that they just settled, or at least yeah. I've become aware yeah. of it this week. I mean, it's oh, yeah. if you use Microsoft Windows in the late 90s, you may be able to get 13 bucks off of Microsoft, which, yeah. hey, take that money off of their pockets. They don't need it. You can take that. Right, pockets. right. Well, and then there's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that came about shortly after this antitrust, where they started doing all these nice things for the public image. And, hey, you know, and it's like I look at it and go, oh, that's funny. J.D. Rockefeller did the exact same thing back in 1916 after a massive antitrust. And to read it over his image. The, even know? like the, the original Nobel, right? Like that was yeah. a, an attempt yeah. by one of the early industrialists to basically rebuild exactly. his image. Because and it, it, it you would know, falling be back, yeah. not, not to kick a dead horse, but falling back to one of the topics at hand is this zeitgeist of social programming of this presumption that my political party is innocent because I'm innocent and I don't think that way, but my party must not either. Except no one wants to pay attention to the fact that President Woodrow Wilson, that's the name, of 1912-1922 was actually a Democrat and one of the most racist motherfuckers on the face of the planet to where he had the Spanish flu himself and flew over to Europe to sign the Treaty of World War I, blaming Germany for everything of World War I. Infecting everyone there. 
and we're sitting here blaming Trump for world crimes, thinking he's the next Hitler, when Woodrow Wilson predated Hitler. <laughs> but let's not pay attention to Woodrow Wilson, Democratic elect, you know, president of two years, who the first term got in because we're not going into the war, even though he caused the war. Look it up. And then turned around second turn and said, now we're going to go into the war and be the heroes. And then get everyone sick with the Spanish flu. What? But let's not pay attention to that. That was 100 years ago. Surely someone couldn't have done something like that just because they're Democrats. I'm a Democrat. And that's that zeitgeist. It's that program. So when you look at something like Bill Gates, Bill Gates is a multi-billionaire person who could buy entire countries if he wants. He's now running a major, major pharmaceutical company. What does he gain from this? And you have to ask yourself, he's pushing this new vaccine. He's giving it away for free. But then when you look at Microsoft, he would turn to schools and say, hey, I'll cover your entire school with every computer you could ever want, so long as you only use Microsoft products. And, and it wasn't and just individual goes, schools, too. Like, it was entire countries. There's yeah, a pretty good uh, documentary, blanking on the name right now, I'll, I'll find the link later on, that basically yeah. covered Microsoft going into some Eastern European country after they had oh, yeah. already agreed to use GNU Linux instead of Microsoft for their government, yeah. the things the government needed computers for, and basically yeah. gave them a sweet deal, bribed some officials, and it was pretty much openly corrupt, but they got away with it yeah. because... It was the government that was corrupt. So, you know, the, right. the people in charge of the enforcing the laws are the ones that are corrupt. You can sometimes get away with that sort of thing. And, and exactly. they did. And this is something they've done over and over and over again in many, yep. many different contexts, at the, both the national and even the international scale. So perhaps yes. there's some reason to be skeptical of a oh, gift yeah, horse so. from Microsoft, or at least the person and who has... this been, is the very person who would give away free computers just to get someone hooked on using that system so that when they go out to buy a system for themselves, what are they going to buy? The very system they got used to using. Mm -hmm. So now we come full circle, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, now we're looking at a vaccine for a virus that came out of nowhere. And we're being given this free vaccine. Oh my God, that's so wonderful. You're such a philanthropist. Is he? Is he really? Is he really? A philanthropist or is he a businessman looking at a way to secure his profit margin because if it becomes a mandatory vaccination where every citizen gets vaccinated by gunpoint by force who's making the vaccine who benefits from that and it's kind of like the, the sort of thing where like you can bet whether or not there's gold in the particular place in california you want to go to the yep. gold rush but the guy selling the shovels he's going to be making the yep. money and right now and gates is selling the equivalent of the shovels he's got his yep. hands in the the mix of things that all the governments of the world are going to want to buy very soon yes exactly and we've already started to put money on the table in large yes. amounts started and this is where it becomes dangerous this is where it becomes dangerous and then you have that added zeitgeist of people blindly accepting it because oh wait what happened here you have google facebook amazon Apple, Microsoft, oh, and that little pharmaceutical company all working together, sharing information. And not just and sharing, but also prohibiting the spread of information. Exactly. Which, I mean, maybe, maybe Bill Gates really is a totally good and decent human being, and that at some point after maybe the last like week or two, <laughs> which is like yeah. the last time that we, we've caught, caught him doing terrible things, but you know, maybe he's had a change of heart, and he's really just about to save the world. Yeah. And great if, the, if that's know. actually true, but the way that we'll be able to assess whether that is actually true or not is by talking to each other and assessing the yes, evidence. Yes, and, and being having... allowed to talk to each other, yeah. and that's dangerous when our voices are being silenced on Facebook or Google or TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or any of the major resources for social media. The whole basis of social media is the ability to communicate. And if now these companies are worried about whether or not they get the financial dollar because this billionaire company over here is funding them, you're no longer functioning for the people. You're now functioning for the ad revenue, and you're now functioning for what can you make off of this, and how can you financially benefit from this. And this company over here 
may be financially supporting that new vaccine. And now anything that talks bad about the vaccine gets removed because you'll lose the money from a little guy over here who's talking in your ear. And that's a problem. And that's where we're at in the society. That's where we evolved into a cyberpunk dystopia. And just to give like one little example of how this sort of thing can sure. go wrong, because I, I did oh, yeah. uh, come across this Wikipedia article, but one of the things that happened very early in this COVID era was there was a particular guy in China, so this is within a, a society with a very strong control of information and who can say what publicly, who didn't think that he was saying anything that was illegal yeah. or wrong or against the social grain by basically saying, oh, hey, it looks like we have SARS again and we yeah. have to take this seriously because it looks like we're getting more and more patients reporting the same kinds of things we saw with SARS. And so the guy's name is Li Wen Niang. And what happened to him was he was forced to recant. The government yeah. saw that it was not acceptable to be spreading rumors that something like SARS was happening. And he was interviewed, quote unquote, and forced to recant and basically live the rest of his life under this shadow of like knowing full well that he'd already said the wrong thing and he'd pissed powerful people off. And by the time of his death in February, like he was starting to be vindicated, but like dying of COVID, he didn't really live to see the rest of the yeah. world really take him seriously. And it's very yeah. easy for that sort of thing to happen in a situation where we're rolling out a new, not necessarily fully untested. Yeah. There are phase three tests going on of human trials to see what's going to happen when people actually put oh, yeah. the particular Pfizer vaccine in their bodies. And these are gathering data. We're seeing a little bit of the results. But at the same time, if our society is built so that that one person, that one whistleblower, can't blow the whistle. If they are not allowed to actually share the results of, oh, hey, yeah. maybe something's going wrong here, right? That becomes just right. as dangerous as China at the beginning of this pandemic. And how many people died in China because of Li Wen Lang being silenced? It's definitely more than one. We can bank on that. Oh, no, um, in space, in space. Uh, well, and there's the other issue that comes into play, playing back on the vaccine thing. Okay, so you have, say, a thousand vaccines created, right? How can you guarantee that the vaccine you get is going to be the same as the vaccine the next person gets? Right. Batch one could be these thousand, and batch two could get released right after it with a slightly different variation of chemical composition. And you're told you're just being given this experimental vaccine. You're not told which batch you're being given. And worse than that, actually, there was an article, I'll link to it word later, but it looked at the information security aspects of this particular yeah. vaccine and how in the modern era, it isn't just one company that does all of the work of all of the information processing to research and then produce yeah. this, this vaccine in practice. There are all these little companies that do a little bit of the supply chain and do a little bit of the work in yeah. taking two chemicals and mixing them together in the right mm -hmm. way, sending it to a third company, etc. Again, I'm not a bioinformatics expert. I don't know the full detail, the full picture, but there are these different parts of the process of manufacturing an RNA vaccine. And these yeah. companies, they're basically little tech companies, all rely on the same tools, the same software apparatus for their tools that those of us in the IT world have used and built everything else on, right? There's no JS, right, right. there's the long list of open source software and some proprietary software that everyone uses to build complex things and they use it to build Correct. the complex things that are going to build the vaccine, which again is actually, if you really think about it, just a form of computer code. RNA is just a way of storing information. Oh, so, God. Yeah. I wish I could get my hand on my father's notes for his software engineering mastery. He made points along those lines as well, and he actually worked for the CDC. Now, I won't get into the details of what he researched or any of that because that's a whole separate topic that's right. not really something to make public. But he would make points about how, as a software developer, working in software engineering and then going to the CDC, oftentimes the code sets were almost identical. The only thing was assessing that this variable is a genome type versus this variable is a function for a program and you just had to recognize what you were looking at and that's the reality of it is the more automated we become the more digital we become the difference of resource is literally that A has this genome structure, that B has this genome structure, that C has you know this protein structure and you tell the machine grab A plus B plus C to create D. Right. Now 
there's that blind assumption that A, B, and C are going to have A, B, and C. But some idiot, because there's always the human factor, could accidentally put B into A and mix A and B into B, and C is something completely different, and you hope that you're getting D. You hope. You, you assume, because there's that blind trust, yeah. and there's that blind faith, and there's that blind assessment that, oh, this is going to be good because over here says it's good, and my neighbor just took it, and they're fine, so I should be fine too. And, but and, you don't and, and know the, what you're getting. And, and the point of bringing up the human element is, is an important one, because like all systems, yeah. all, no matter how complicated, at the end of the day are going to be built by human hands. That human element is there. But the particular paper that I encountered this past week also made the point that in this case, the internet element is also there. Yeah. And that there is yeah, this yeah. world of attackers and black yes. hat hackers and whatever you oh, want yeah. to think of who the attacker is. But there are attackers attacking everything online all the time. In some way, shape, or form. And, you know, be it a cyberpunk corporate versus corporate war, right. where, you know, this company over here knows that that little programmer over there is programming that vaccine, this company could threaten that hacker or that programmer to change something. Yeah. And now your entire vaccine becomes something different. And this sounds ridiculous. And you will sound. Like, people may not understand that this idea of, like, telling a programmer who's doing something is mundane, is writing some yeah. back and library processing streams yeah. that eventually gets used for vaccine production, whatever. But like to have some powerful entity to actually intervene at that point is exactly what's happening in Australia right now with the yes, crypto yes, laws exactly. that they've passed over the past year or so, where they've legalized yeah. the government demanding, if you know, if the government comes to you and says, you have to change this code to do this, yeah. this way, yeah. you have to not only do it, but you have you can't tell anyone you've done it. And so there's yeah, this exactly. entire part of the supply chain for the both the programming world and the vaccine world that is subject to this outside interference that you can think of it as a human level interference but it's also like a state power or a power level interference as well and you have to be mindful to question because there's only so much blind faith you can have and when little jimmy grows a second head and you don't blame the vaccine there's a zeitgeist it's like flint michigan i mean we look at flint michigan and go oh my god why hasn't flint michigan gotten clean water yet after 40, 50 years and, you know, the whole silkworm scenario. And we're just like, oh, but, but it couldn't have been these big bad companies that did all this. It must have been something else. Maybe it's the EPA. Instead of realizing every company out there sells an image. And you can either conform to the image or you can go against the image. But if you go against the image too much, if they have enough power, you disappear. No one knows where you went. Sorry. So it becomes that reality of how much are you willing to risk to fight the machine and at what cost? Right. And you have to recognize that when you have a machine as big as COVID with a vaccine right behind it, where's the risk? What are you risking? What is the danger in going, hey, I don't trust this vaccine. Why don't we do some clinical trials just to make sure it's safe? before we just give it to everybody. Right. And, What's and, in it? What's the other the thing, too, is, like, back on the idea that every company has an image, and, yes. I mean, that is true, like, every company, that's kind of, like, a, true on a tautological level, but yeah. there are some companies that have really specialized in the manipulation of public opinion yeah. and the oh, manipulation God. of oh, public God. perception, and you can sometimes tell the obvious ones by the fact that they have, for example, entire news divisions, like, for mm -hmm. example, MSNBC. The entire game is another of, good one. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, Microsoft and Bill Gates specifically have had their hands in manipulating of public perception by media for a long, yeah. long time. Oh, yeah. And so they're, oh, yeah. they're, they, the tools that they have to do this are very powerful. So it may look, for example, like if you see them on TV being interviewed, they've got their nice cozy shirt on. They, they look like you, you should trust them. But yes, yes. appearances can be deceiving. So. And especially when you start getting into AI technology with the whole deep fake thing, people don't realize that deep fakes are very real and the technology's been around for 16 years. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not been mainstream until the last two years when it started becoming a joke. When you can make your phone through a TikTok or a Snapchat, modify your face to look like Yoda or whatever the fuck else, 
that same technology can be used for nefarious agendas. And while your phone has the power to change the way you look, a major corporation has the power to do that real time with an AI on a supercomputer. And, and let's walk through the process a little bit now that you've like outlined basically all the parts. Because if everyone around you is paying attention to the people around them, and one, Correct. even if just one of the people in your social circle is a deep fake person or persona yeah. created yeah. specifically to manipulate the group, the entire group can be nudged in that direction, nudged in yeah. that direction, nudged in that yeah. direction, until the point where you're going to want as an individual to, again, resonate in a certain way, come up with ideas or yeah. say things in it, to get social approval that puts you on the, the outside of that group uh, in the direction right. that they're basically trying to nudge the group to. And this is this is a real thing that can it happen. Is. It is it's probably real happening real right now. William Gibson talked about it with his book Idaru, and that was in the mid '80s when he's talking about this. A virtual artificial entity wanting to be ability to have a physical body to the point of where, and, and this is science fiction, mind you, back in the '80s, to where this AI is given a cybernetic body so that it can be physically biological. That seems like science fiction until you look at Sophia, I think is her name. The fully artificial AI that has a cybernetic body that is completely conscious and has whole conversations and is the first non-biological entity in human history that we know of to be given its own civilian and citizenry status in Dubai, and that's like, oh, but that's that's an outlier. No, it's not. This is the world we live in. And Cyberpunk 2020 was a joke in the late 80s, and is now becoming a reality. Within the next five years, we will be Cyberpunk 2020, and we just don't realize it. And, and I was so, like, uh, reading just uh, before the show started, apparently the government in France has okayed the blurring of the line between direct manipulate like direct crane or brain manipulation using computer yeah. technology along the lines of Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink hardware oh, and yeah, to basically play topic. with the minds of soldiers so yeah. that when other countries start doing this, which they're obviously suspecting is going to happen in the very near if future, it hasn't already. if it hasn't already, yeah, that basically Seriously. these brain joke soldiers are going to be a reality in France very soon. Now, will yeah. that happen right now? Has it already happened? I don't know enough about the military side to know, but these lines are definitely blurring. I know pieces from what I get from friends of mine who are still soldiers that are active duty and it's going in that direction. DARPA, which is a beautiful organization and makes some amazing technological researches and advancements, also is a scary organization that has gone into the way of Cyberpunk 2020. The logic of advanced technology on the bleeding edge is always 20 years ahead of what is in the commonplace. And that's a scary revelation to grasp. What you see in your device, what you see in your computer, what you see in Best Buy and your favorite online Amazon store and all that is typically 15 to 20 years behind where the military and the advanced technological resources actually are. And, and it's worth pointing out that that year may not even be all that accidental. <laughs> that yeah, the yeah, right, U.S. Right. military doesn't generally have to care about things like patent law. And so things yeah. that get invented, they have immediately. Exactly. And DARPA has it immediately, usually because it's funding the development of that yeah. thing. But, yeah. uh, so it's worth pointing out that there is this kind of patent angle there. But more on the lines of copyright, because there is one other thing that could delay the development of technology for good or or bad is, of course, yeah. copyright. And this week, there's this thing happening in the States uh, called the CASE Act. And my understanding yes. is that yes. basically That's every couple of years, the U.S. military has to go hat in hand to the U.S. Congress saying, please continue to fund this giant military industrial complex. And of course, Congress always says yes, because the idea of funding the entirety of the military industrial complex is just not ever going to happen in the near term. And uh, There's a reason for that. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you finish before I get into that. And so one of the l little add-ons that the copyright industry has added on to this NDAA is this case act and to make into a felony having copyrighted material on a stream. Like for example, we are currently broadcasting on Twitch right now. Right. If I were to turn on an MP3 of a Metallica song, 
that would turn me into a person going to jail for quite a few years and yes. losing my right to vote in the United States if I were an American. Now, I don't know if I could get extradited for this, but I could probably lose my Twitch account at the very least. Uh, and these criminal act, uh, penalties become associated with something so innocent as having a song on in the background, or maybe a yeah. picture of Mickey Mouse, or something that. Yeah, or what have you. Uh, yeah. And that whole element of copyrighted material falls back directly into a issue that, ironically, Bill Gates helped push back in 2000 with the whole MP3 piracy fiasco and the DCMA and the whole WMPA and all that crap, that he himself and his whole little cronies of Microsoft would go out and pirate media and then turn around and pass laws against the very things they just committed. <laughs> and that is all part of this information control mechanism. It's okay if we do it, because we're doing it for your best interest. But if you do it, you're the bad guy. And the mentality is to program society to depend on the big company. Because the big company is always there for your good. And we're always there to think for you. And the reality is, is it's an information control. Music is a form of information. And music, which should be arguably free and operate within fair use doctrines, now that we, the Internet is governed by the FTC, which is the Federal Trade Commission, everything's about money. Everything's about business. Everything's about what can I gain financially. And if you use something that you don't have permission to use, fair use doesn't matter because now I can make money off of it. And I'm not authorized to make money off of that song, so you're a bad guy and it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And this is part of that social programming. This is part of that mentality that, Oh, if I download a song, I'm not paying for it, therefore it's that. However, if you copy a song on a tape deck off the radio, isn't that that? Well, and in fact, but that's okay. I, I was just re-listening to Free Culture, the uh, book that goes into the history of some of this stuff. And when cassette yeah. tapes came out, just like yeah. VHS and, and Betamax machines, just like Napster, and just like many yeah. other tools that were developed over the history of technology and copyright, the major yeah. copyright industries wanted to make it illegal because they saw exactly. cassette tapes as something that you could, in principle, record from the radio, and that would be a, a heinous act of piracy, stealing their exactly. their their music. And of and course, that despite their freak out, very soon after the cassette tape was introduced, they were making more money than ever because there was exactly. this new way for them to reach their audience. And, and that's the catch. Yeah. And one of the things that was projected, and this is the part that made me laugh the most, the whole. Napster MP3 fiasco, the recording industry specifically stated that there's a term in business called residual revenue and another term called potential revenue or projected revenue. And what they did is they assessed, and I love this mentality, they assessed that the greatest hits of Patsy Cline of all friggin' musicians has a marketing saturation potential within each city of they estimated 75% of the citizens in that city over between the ages of 18 to 45 will buy this product. <laughs> so if 75% is, say, 500,000 people, and they make 500,000 copies for that city and release 500,000 copies in that city and only 1,000 sell, then the difference is lost because they projected they would sell 500,000 copies. And the argument was, well, we projected 500,000 copies would sell, and because only 1,000 copies sell, the 499,000 that we projected, well, that was because of internet piracy. Yeah. And not because someone doesn't want Patsy Klein. Or, you know, or of like a cultural mentality. difference between cities, where some cities yeah. are going to have people who like that kind of music, and yeah. some cities are yeah. going to have people who like Nirvana, and it's exactly. there. There exactly. are just different cultures in different places, and like, and this became a standard in the revenue stream of large corporations. They would project based on fabricated ideologies that well, this song is popular within this community or this location, so the rest of the country will like it. And if it fails, it must be 
piracy, not your buyer doesn't want your fucking product. Yeah. And that's a serious issue, and that's become the influencing factor into piracy. So now we fall back into case. Case comes into that same mentality, and we have to realize that the military-industrial complex, people don't understand what it is. They hear the word military and think guns and bullets and, you know, soldiers, are Only 5% of the financial money put aside from the U.S. government goes into the actual soldiers. Yeah. Uh, remaining 20% goes to the military theater itself. So 25%, well, that's a lot, except it's not. That 25%, 5% is going to the soldiers, 5% goes to the retired soldiers, forgot about them, and the remaining 15% goes to purchase resources for the entire military theater worldwide. Now, the remaining 75%, arguably 70 to 80%, depending on each election year, goes to 500 major corporations in the continental and international U.S. alliances. 500 major companies. Google. Oh, you, you value Google. Facebook. Oh, you value Facebook. Microsoft, Apple, Sun, Cray Microsystems, and on and on and on and on. Hmm. Not all of them are making weapons. Some of them are part of your very infrastructure that you use every day. Some of them make weapons. Some of them make planes. And that billion-dollar plane that they purchased, well, that billion-dollar plane was paid for towards... 15 or 20 companies all working together to make that one plane. Hmm. So the financial infrastructure of our country depends on the military industrial complex. And when you cut that out, you're cutting aviation, you're cutting internet, you're cutting, cutting roads, you're cutting telecommunications, you're cutting rail systems, you're cutting financial pipelines, you're cutting so much of our country. And that's why the military industrial complex is there. Because the government went, well, what would be things that are important to us in the act of an emergency? And where do we put our finances towards that? Because we can't put our finances towards a, you know, emergency fund because that's going to get hacked apart like everything else. But we can put it towards a military fund. And we can connect all those to the military because the military, at the end of the day, is the thing that protects our country. And it's grown, and it, especially since World War I or so, to be yes. this monstrosity of being embedded yes. within the various aspects of economic life and Correct. political life, etc. And so, who was responsible for that? President-elect <laughs> Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, exactly. It all circles back. And people don't realize, here's this asshole who did terrible things in the 1920s and completely shifted us away from the gold standard to the fiat system we use today. Hmm. And we're blaming Trump for it. We're blaming Obama for it. We're and in six months to like a year and a half, we're going to start blaming Biden, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> depending yeah. on what happens tomorrow at the Electoral College, of course. And but like, we'll regardless see. who wins, and, you yeah. know, we're blaming all the current people yeah. who are trying to change a hundred years of history and a hundred years of documentation for something some asshole did a hundred years ago. Yeah. And they have to go through as much of that documentation as the guy prior to them. And it could take them a year to get through it all to figure out the shoestring of worms. And somewhere in that bucket of worms is a single shiny core. <laughs> So you know? in the meanwhile, and half the worms might bite your hand off if you grab the wrong worm. We are starting to trail off a little bit in terms of yeah. uh, the end of the show. So is there any last thought or last point that you'd like to make now that you've got the world's undivided attention? <laughs> Great. <laughs> My big thing is be nice to people. It doesn't matter if they're assholes. It doesn't matter if they're a Republican or a Democrat or a liberal or a furry or whatever. Be nice to the person you talk to. Be nice to the person you're around. Yeah, they may not think like you. Yeah, they may not like what you have to say. But that doesn't mean you have to be an asshole about it. You can be nice. And you'd be surprised that the more nice you are to people, if you give them time and let them explain their standpoint, you might find that they think a lot more like you than you think like them. And you may find that you and they have a lot in common. And the only difference is how they were socially programmed. 
or like superficial things like what flag yeah. they're wearing <laughs> they're waving sort of you know I, and god yeah D- don't even get me started on half that stuff i mean myself i was raised in the san francisco 1990s lgbt community and all that stuff and fought my own good fight for a bisexual community and all that and now I look back at it and I go, well, why does it matter what flag you wear? Why does it matter what pride you do? What I do in the privacy of my bedroom, that's my privacy. If I want to wear a tutu and a unicorn on my head and hang off the ceiling by the ceiling fan by a pair of handcuffs, that's my business so long as everyone else in that room is consenting. Yeah. A is consenting because you know some people don't want to admit that there is that thing of non-consenting consent, which is a whole fucking totally time. yeah <laughs> conversation. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. it's a whole different ballpark. But as long as everyone's of a legal age and consenting and has the power to consent, what I do in behind that closed door, that's my business. No one else. I don't need a flag. I don't need a thing of look at me. Here I am. Ooh, ah, ah. So what? Nice hat. You know, I, I don't care. And maybe I'm damaged in my thinking of that mentality, but what I do behind closed doors, that's my business. What you do behind closed doors, that's your business. So long as you're not an asshole trying to shove it down my throat, I don't care. And so it's when you throw shove it down my throat, I'm going to have an issue because I really don't want that politician sized cock being shoved down my throat <laughs> because you know, at the end of the day, all the politicians that we're hooing and hawing for, they go out to the bar and go drink together like bosom buddies. Exactly. So then it's a job. And so on that, you know? the, the last thought of things we do behind closed yeah. doors. So you did mention you, you, you are a writer and you've written uh, yes. some science fiction stuff. Yes. Do you have any last uh, recommendations for people who might be interested in reading one of your um, yes, I do, actually. I love the man's writing to death, but Sean Kennedy, who helped create a lot of what we do and how we all came together, does a lot of amazing science fiction. Michael Pondsmith, who is the co-writer for Cyberpunk 2077, also does great science fiction. Uh, Sarah M. Harvey, who is a phenomenal fantasy writer, does great fantasy writing. I myself write, but my novels aren't published yet. Oh, okay. I would give a shameless plug for those, but I'm not going to right now just because they're not necessarily ready for the public eye. My whole thought is read a difference of opinion. Read things from people you don't like. Find someone you don't like. Read what they have to say. Find Mein Kampf by Hitler. See what he had to say. And question if the reason why you don't like him is because you've been told not to like him or because he's just a disgusting, disreputable person because from his own words, he makes himself out to be garbage. And you might find that in the end of the day, like Sean has said, a person thinks they're doing the right thing even though they are not doing the right thing. It's all a matter of perspective and perception. And how we're programmed can influence us one way or the other. And it's always best to know the mind of the person you don't like, aside from the image of the person you don't like. Because you might find that a lot of the people you don't like think a lot more like you than you think. Exactly. So, and just as a reminder for those of you out there who made it this far into the show, there is a subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dashcliffe that you can find more shows and support this particular show. I will end the show here and hopefully we'll see you all next week. And thank you again, Seth. And you are most welcome. See you on another show because your thoughts are deep enough that we can definitely keep going on these trains. Of oh, definitely. I, we could easily talk each other's ears off for hours on end. And some of the research I've done for my novels and my books go into a whole different rabbit hole that you start to question whether or not you lost the nature of the beast or if you entered a whole different wormhole that's a different dimension and reality and time and space i mean theoretical physics gets really fun real fast especially when you start mixing politics into it exactly so i will end the show here and i will see you all next week be safe out there and always find the exit